العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والحمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم العن أول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابعا له على ذلك اللهم العن العصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتله اللهم العنهم جميعا ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين Unfortunately we are nearing the end of the month and uh, due to this I still want to cover whatever questions were left some of the questions we may not have mentioned but they were covered in discussions so they might not have been written up but they have been covered in discussions. Uh, tonight I'll be covering five questions with the permission of God. And inshallah, tomorrow I'll be covering another, I think, four or five questions. Like three, I'm going to try and answer them in a rapid fashion, and then the other two in a more extensive uh, way. And in the end, all in all, I'm going to try and to be, I want to try and be as concise as possible. I know this, people, this is something that should have been answered because it was. Before Shah Ramadan, when I was explaining to people. So they've written, if one puts up on their social media a fabricated hadith unknowingly, in brackets, during the night of Ramadan relating to the infallibles and it remains on his social media for 24 hours, would it invalidate his fast the next day even though he did it the night before? Okay, we touched on this before Shah Ramadan. It won't invalidate your fast unless you did it while fasting, initially. But, here's the rules. See, what Samahta Sayyid says, in the, in, in the question here, he says, إِذَا أَعْتَقَدَ الصَّائِمْ صِدْقَ خَبَرِهِ عَنْ اللَّهِ أَوْ عَنْ أَحَدَ الْمَعْصُومِينَ عَلَيْهُمُ السَّلَامِ Okay, so the person that puts up the hadith, if they have a belief that this is a truthful narration about Allah, all the infallibles. So if someone puts a hadith and they have belief that this hadith is correct, in general, if you're fasting, they have belief it's a correct hadith. They're not doing something. It's not. So, and later they find out it wasn't a correct hadith, their fasting isn't invalidated. Then he says, نعم, إذا أخبر عن الله أو عن أحد المعصومين عليهم السلام على سبيل الجزم على غير معتمد على حجة شرعية مع احتمال كذب الخبر. So the thing is, one says we I had اعتقاد that the narration I put was truthful. I believed in it. The second one, I haven't done what's necessary. Especially with narrations, the unnecessary tasks, I have to take it from a reliable person. There's a lot of, like, for example, when I'm getting a mas'ali shar'i, how do I get a fatwi? This is important. How do you get a fatwi? If I ask you right now, you wanted a fatwi, how do you get a fatwi? Do you get it off Facebook? If you take a fatwi off Facebook, that's incorrect. If you take a fatwi off any social media outlet, it's incorrect. The first way to get a mas'ali shar'i is from who? From the marja himself. The marja himself tells you that's sufficient. The second one is from an authenticated book. This book is authenticated from the marja. That's the second way. The third way is from someone that you trust. When they speak, they speak and they understand. And the fourth one is what? As usual, two just people say the same thing. Other than that, I can't just follow a fatwa when someone tells me. Someone says that, you know, um, you be sitting down, people say this is haram or this is permissible. And people run with it and they don't even know what they're talking about. So we, 
So if I actually get the fatwa without doing the right measurements, and he says, وَكَانَ كَذِبًا فِي الْوَاقِعِ جَرَى عَلَيْهِ حُكْمُ التَّعَمُّدِ So if it turns out to be incorrect, because I didn't do the correct manner in attaining this hadith, then it is as if I did it knowingly. I fabricated. So that's the first question. The second question, I know they might sound as silly questions, but the questions. Can I listen to music in Ramadan month? Is it haram? Firstly, listen. I'm going to assume they're actually asking, because that's what I think, that they're actually asking, does music invalidate the fast? Firstly, music is, that's used in places of entertainment is haram. So any singer or music that's used in places of entertainment is haram. And this is where it comes to your discernment. You're supposed to be the one that differentiates in this. But does it break my fast? No, it doesn't break my fast. But what's haram before Shah Ramadan? What's haram after Shah Ramadan? Is haram in Shah Ramadan. It doesn't change. There are things that invalidate the fast. This doesn't invalidate the fast, but it incurs sin and it will incur divine wrath. That's the second question. The third question, does a wet dream, okay, احتلم, or as well, someone بيحتلم in their sleep, which basically, um, for those that understand wet dream, that means they have, they, they've had a wet dream. As for everyone else, well, your dreams are still dry, but they're going to get wet. So anyway, does a dream invalidate your fast? And is it beyond our control, but also causing impurity? Firstly, if... I'll give you something very simple. If you have the wet dream at night and you wake up at night, because we call this as considered the first sleep. You're asleep. You wake up at night, you've had a wet dream. You have to do ghusl because it's before fajr. But let's say I woke up. This is the easiest way I can do it. If you wake up in the day, say you're asleep in the day, you wake up at 11 a.m. and you've had a wet dream. It's not necessary for you to get up and do ghusl immediately. Because one of the, the shurut, one of the conditions of fasting is that I do not begin my fast in the state of janab. If this happens while I sleep in the day, I can go back to sleep if it's in the day. But if this happened in the night, I have to get up and perform my ghusl. Otherwise, my fast will not be valid if I deliberately... And there's a lot of laws. I don't want to go d- delve into this too far. So basically, if you've had the dream before Fajr, you get up and do ghusl. You have had the dream after Fajr, then you've got the option. If you don't understand the question, then it's not um, up to you to learn it now. You can go ask your father and he'll explain it to you if you're a male. Secondly, that's the, sorry, that's the third question. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa alayhi Could you please explain the ruling on permissibility of getting a mortgage even though there is interest? Most maraja mentioned change your intention, but I can't understand how you do that when you know you have to pay back interest. Before we begin, there is absolutely no doubt that riba or usury is haram. There's no doubt. There's no ambiguity in the matter whatsoever. But generally, as usual... It's coded with a nicer word, like interest. Like a sodomite is called gay. This is called interest. It tries to make it sound better. But it's still usually, it's called riba. And riba is something that's forbidden. And it's one of the grand sins. It's not a small sin, it's a grand sin. Okay. See, many people take loans and forbidden loans and don't look into what they're actually doing. And what are the consequences of their actions? What is that I'm actually doing? When I take a loan, is this loan permissible or not? Okay, now the question is, why is it allowed in circumstances? I'm going to try and break it down. Firstly, we have what's called an Islamic bank. You've seen those Islamic banks? They're out of bounds. So these, just put them out, let's not look at these. They're out of bounds, you can't get loans from them these Islamic banks at all. But let's look at the other two types of banks. One which they call Bank Al-Ahli. And the other one's called, okay, what? 
Um, one's called Bank Al Ahli, the other one's called uh, the bank that's the, from the Hukuma or Hukumi. The one's, huh? Huh? Yeah, government. There's Bank Ahli and there's Bank Hukumi. Let's take a look at these two. I wasn't looking for the translation, I don't know why everyone's giving it to me. Bank Al Ahli is a bank that is what? It's bank that is privately owned. Meaning what? It means that the patrons are the ones that put the money in the bank and the money that is loaned to you is what? Their money. How many banks do you know like this? I don't, I don't know any, if you, unless you know. I don't really know there's that many banks where they actually give what's in the actual bank. The second type is a bank hukumi. There's also a bank that's mushtarak. This bank is one that is what we call a corporate bank. Not corporate bank in the sense that it's part hukumi, which as the translation was given, government, and also what? It's part private. These both fall under the same category. For the bank al-ahli, the one that the money is from the patrons, you can't take a loan because this is what riba is. Riba is when someone gives you their money and asks for interest on it. As for a corporate bank or a government bank, we say bank mushtarak or bank hukumi, they have their own rules. What are the rules? Their rules in Islam is firstly, the money that's in the bank is unknown from where it came from. It's mixed. So in this case, okay, you're taking the money with the intention that the money that's given to you is majhul al-malik. What does majhul al-malik mean? It means it has an anonymous owner. We don't know who owns the money. So this money that's majhul al-malik, you need authority from the marja to take this money. Now the maraja, before you'd have to get the authority. Whereas in the case of Sayyid Sistani, Sayyid Sistani has given an open authority. He says that he is authorized for anyone to take this mail. And what it becomes, they call it, uh, um, it's called, they say it, call it muluk majani. You know, so it's, it's, it's like, you just pick it up, it's yours. So basically that money becomes yours. So you're taking the loan, so you're taking the money without the intention of loan, you're taking it with the intention that this money is what? Is money that has no owner and that you've taken it with the authority of the marja. And it doesn't, so when you do this, if you can get away, but they're the rules, without paying the interest, then you don't pay the interest. But if you have to, then you have to. Because then you're forced to pay the money back. So in this case, uh, when I'm taking this money, this is the only authorization for you to take it. This is the only way that you can take it. Now someone will come up and say, what? This is ridiculous. They say, you know, where do you come in these? You're playing around with God's law. Don't they say that? You hear this all the time. It's funny when they say this because they do stuff like this all the time. But when it comes to something they don't like, they'll question. See, for example, when you tell them, when someone, for example, buys a dog, are you allowed to buy a dog, Sharan? Haram. Haram to buy a dog and haram to sell a dog. It's haram. So how do people acquire a dog? And the Sharan. I come and say I've got a purebred German Shepherd and I say, oh, this dog is worth like $1,000, say, for example. I no longer own this dog. It's free. It's out in the open. Someone comes and says, um, well, I'm going to take ownership of this dog because no one owns it anymore and I would like to give you a gift of $1,000. That's how it works. Someone comes and goes, how is this possible? They're the rules. This is how the rules are. And everyone does this every day of their lives, unless you own only cash money. Who here owns only cash money? Nothing else. If you take money from the bank, you are 
playing with this. Why? Because the money with the bank can only be taken because, you know, we talk about, when we talk about money, actual money, we haven't a way yet on this. That when there's hummus, for example, it's the actual money that you have to hummus. So how is it that I can get the money from the bank and pay hummus with the authority of the marja? Your earnings, your pay, when it goes in the bank, are you getting the same money that your bank puts in, that your employer puts in the bank? No, you're getting someone else's money. How is it halal on you now? From the authority of the marja, because that money's disappeared into the system. It's not like, it's not like you know, when you go to the... Um, when you go to the pools or something and they got the locker or the gym, you put your stuff in the locker, you open the locker and take your stuff out. Imagine you put your stuff in a locker and it just got jumbled out and it would spit out any shoes or... That's pretty much what you're doing in a bank. Okay? The marja here gives you the authority. And everyone goes with it. And everyone agrees with it. But when it comes to something they don't do, they'll question. This is why... Jurisprudence is a field for those that understand it. And those that don't understand it, don't give your two bobs worth. Just like you don't and you shouldn't give your two bobs worth in any field that you have no understanding of. Keep your opinion to yourself. How do we look at the idea of debt while we're here? Debt is a bit like getting yourself in debt or taking a loan. It's a bit like those that seek the world. Pretty much you want things now, okay? And you want quick results now without parting with anything just yet. It can feel like, when you get a loan, it can feel like you're getting something for nothing. You know, because you're sitting down, someone says, here's $5,000. Wow. I didn't work for it. It's now in my hands. But eventually, a loan and a debt will catch up to you. So debt is pretty much an advanced payment that you have to return. And... This is why one of the biggest problems with debts, and we've got to be aware of this, we all have this problem. You go purchase something, you know, now especially with the tapping system, you know how easy it is, you walk in, tap, walk out. You don't realise how much you're spending, tap, 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 tap. And now they've made it, because COVID, it's, it's made it even easier. Before there was a $100 limit, before you put your pin, now there's a $200 limit, because they don't want people touching things, you know. So you're tapping more than ever now. And you're just accumulating this debt, $100 here, 150 there, 195 there, and you add them all up before you know you've spent so much money and you've incurred so much debt. The more debt you accumulate, the more repayments that you have. And if you look at like countries, Lebanon's a really good system of, of looking at. They're where everyone's put into debt in Lebanon. You know, the tobacco farmers, they're put into debt. So the bank says, listen, how many fields can you grow? That many, we're going to give you that much money. So they give them a loan. Then the farmers are forced to farm what? Tobacco. Because this is the only thing the government pays back. So they put them in this loan system where everyone's locked in and they owe the government money. They're always in a constant debt. If you look, the longest verse in the Quran is what? The verse about loan and debt it's something big it's something where people have to write it's something that we should really think about before we put ourselves in any debt the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says in a narration iyakum waddain beware when it comes to loaning taking loans he says fa innahu hammun billayl wa dhullun wa dhullun wa dhwa bin nahar Debt at night is worries. People worry about debt. And in the day, it's humiliation. You're indebted to someone. That's why you have to go to work for something extra. You're doing the overtime to pay off something you didn't really need to buy. Something that you really didn't need to do. But you put yourself in that situation from debt. The debt can lead to mild or severe health problems as well. People sit there and worry about what they owe. It's, it's, cause, it's a big cause of what? Ulcers? Stomach ulcers are caused by debt, believe it or not. It's a big cause of migraines. You have a look at all these people that have this. It's a big cause of depression and heart attacks. Just people having loans that they didn't need to have. I remember once, and it also puts you, when I said, when you say dhullun, 
إنه مذلي as we say بالنهار. I remember once this story. Uh, my father told me once this man borrowed off a man another guy ten thousand dollars, and this was back in the 1980s. And ten thousand dollars was a lot of money back then. And he um, loaned him the money, and this other guy was unable to pay it in in due time. So the other guy would always tell him, no, that's all right, take your time paying me back. My father told me this man would always come to his house and hang out at his house. He goes, oh, what's your wife making today? And he'd just sit there and hang out. And he'd have to put up with him because he owes him money. And he says he would say like all these lines, you know, where, you know those lines that cut under your skin? You know, little lines, you know, oh, lucky for me. Or otherwise you would have been in a dump somewhere. You know, he'd say stuff like that. Kept putting him down. He had to put up with it because he put himself in a debt and was stuck in that position. So this is what it does. It causes you to be humiliated. So it can cause what? It can cause a shortened life. Al Imam Abu Abdullah al Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam says, "Khaffifu al-Dain, fa inna fi khaffat al-Dain ziyadat al-Umr." Ziyadat al-umr. That he says, lessen your debt and your loan because with a lesser loan, lesser debt, you'll have a longer life. This is a problem, getting yourself into debt. That's why I shouldn't go get a loan unless it's necessary. If it's not necessary, why would I put myself in that position? Why would I want to put my... You look at a lot of people, I know a lot of people that didn't have debts. And they were happy. The second they got a debt, they just, well, they're miserable. You look at them, they're miserable. And I see this all the time. I'll be talking to someone and they've got debts and they're always, they're always down in the dumps and I go, thank God I owe no one money. This is awesome. You know, yeah, he's got a nicer car than me. Yeah, he's got a nicer house. But he's miserable. You know, he's put himself into so much unnecessary misery. Okay. The other thing when it comes to debt is it can transform your entire life. Al-Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam says, كَثْرَةُ الدَّيْنِ تُصَيِّرُ الصَّادِقْ كَاذِبًا وَالْمُنْجِزَ مُخْلِفًا What does it do? A lot of debt can transform a sadiq into a liar, a truthful person into a liar. وَالْمُنْجِزْ what? Into a mukhlif. The people that are reliable, that you rely upon, become what? Become unreliable. Debt causes them to become like this. Debt causes them to become in this position where you can't trust them anymore. I remember one quick story where one, one Muslim man, he stopped talking to his own father for years because of the debts that his father had got the family into. And I asked him, why don't you talk to your father? So I wanted him to talk back to his He said, because my father used to be truthful. He's a liar now. You can't believe a word he says. He lies to everyone. He's humiliated us publicly. He lies to everyone he sees, but he used to be truthful. Because of the debts he's put himself into, it's turned him into somebody that he was not. Okay. Our final question is the challenge of Riyah. Riyah, and I'll explain what Riyah is. He says he has become such a major problem in our communities. People seem to compete with one another doing actions rather than for the sake of Allah. Examples, people telling you, I've prayed all night, I've been donating to orphans, I'm a hard worker, which actually defeats the purpose of the action as it's no longer for God. How do you tackle and deal with such issues? Okay, Riyah, basically, he's explained it there. Riyah is when I do something for other than God. And a lot of the actions people do are for other than God. A lot of the actions. Allah Azza wa Jal in the last verse of Surah Al-Kahf, this verse is the one you read if you want to wake up in the morning. But this is half of it. He says in the Quran, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلِيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا So whoever hopes or has aspirations to have a meeting with their Lord, return to their Lord, he said, let him do righteous actions, a righteous work. You all know it. Do not 
partner with anyone or associate in your worship of your Lord with anyone. All right. Now, this verse is about Riyah. You hear the word shirk, you think shirk, yes. Riyah is the lesser shirk. The greater shirk is the open one where I take partners with God. This is the one that's smaller. Doesn't mean it's less. It's less, I'll explain why it's less. It won't throw you into hell. But what it will do is it makes your actions null and void. You prayed? Yes, you prayed. There's no reward. Why? You didn't do it for me. You did it for the people that are watching you. You gotta get the reward from them. But I'll tick you off because you were there. You know, people saw you praying. You fasted? Yes. You went to Hajj, you came back, people called you Hajj. You went to Ziyarat al Hussein alayhi salam. You had to tell, you know, and this is something a lot of people do the Mashai and they tell you about how hard the Mashi was and stuff. So, oh, I did this on that. Do you know something? You'd be surprised. And I will tell you something. The first time you tell someone, you lose the reward of secrecy. The second time, it becomes real. It becomes like you did it for someone else. So you have the opportunity to get the reward and the reward of secrecy. The reward of secrecy is so grand. You want to know how grand the reward of secrecy is? That when Ayyub, Ayyub, out of all the things he was tried, what was he tried? He lost his family. Isn't that right? He lost everything. The biggest trial he went through was he disclosed his secret. Did you know that? That's what the biggest trial for him was. Disclosing his secret. What happened is some writers came up to him and said, Oh, Ayyub, what sins have you committed that Allah has punished you the way he has punished you? And he said, Well, unto you. He said, Do you not know if there are two good actions for me to do? I do the one that's more difficult to do. And you're accusing me of sin. And that was the worst thing for him that he had to disclose a secret that he had. This is the thing. When you do some good action that no one knows about. This is your prized piece. Why? Because there was a khlas in that. Because see, I mentioned before, you're walking with some mu'mneen, an attractive woman walks past, astaghfirullah, you look down. When you're on your own, it's you and God. You know? How many brothers got shot down in this manner? Think about it. It's you and God. That's all. It's just you and God. Am I going to look down or am I going to keep looking? This is where the difficult test is. But look, let's think of this. You do all believe in God. And you do believe in God is the only one that avails you. That's what we talk about. The only one that saves you. The only one that sustains you, the only one that gives you, the only one that protects you. God is the only one. You know he's the creator. You know he is sufficient for us. We all know this. We all know there's a day of judgment. The only one that will avail us on the day of judgment is God Almighty. Do we have any doubt? Anyone here have any doubt of this? No, we don't. Then why do we do things for people? Why is it do we do things for people? When I know the person is as petty as I am, you know? Imagine like a beggar begging a beggar. Really, think about it. Imagine there's two poor people, they're going through a trash can to find something to eat, and one starts begging the other guy. What would you think of these people? When you laugh at them, this is what people are doing. Kaifa, yes, alo? Kaifa, yes, alo, muhtaja, muhtaja. Have you heard that in the dua? The Imam says, Imam Ali ibn al-Hussain, salawatu alayhi wa sallam, he says, how does the needy ask the needy? How? So how do I act for other people to sit and watch me? Why do I share my actions with others and rather than have it solely for myself? Why do I just say, all right, I'll give it to someone else and there's no benefit in that there? Riya is a reflection of how I actually view Allah. If I believe Allah, this is something I have to think about. Do I really believe Allah is the only one that writes everything up? When you read the verse, وَقُلْ amalu, The do, سَيَرَ اللَّهُ So that Allah sees your actions and His Messenger. 
and the believers. Do you actually mean think that the believers means the believers that you see? No. The believers are the ones that we have narrations that says that your actions will be shown by Allah, because Allah sees all, to the messenger of Allah and to your imam. Your imam looks at your actions. The imam sees your actions. And this is all that's sufficient. Why? Because he is God's representative. So firstly, riya is to do an action. First part of riya is someone that does it just for people. That they do everything. The mura'i is the mura'i, the, the full level mura'i is a munafiq. If a mura'i is like, like 100% mura'i, is a munafiq. There's no way you could be 100% unless you someone that doesn't believe. The mura'i basically is, you know how they say the hypocrite never misses a prayer? He's the one that is a function, he's always there. There's salah, he's always praying in the front line. Everything they're always there. Bikil aras al ursa, as we say. Everywhere there's something, they always turn up. They're always there, they're always involved in it. There's just something about them that doesn't add up. And you can't put your finger on it. You know those people, you just can't put the, your, your, your finger on it. I remember there was a collaborator in Lebanon. But there was one guy that pointed him out that this guy was working with Israel. And the way he worked him out was he said, this guy, every majlis, he would be the one giving out the tea, he'd pick up the shoes, and he would cry in the majlis. He was doing everything, multi-skilled. And he said he'd always be everywhere there was... And then he said one day, the thing, this is the one that got him, he said he went to the mahwar where the, 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 the brothers are fighting, where the soldiers are... Uh, uh, see, he said he took off his boots and they said why are you taking off boots he says this is take off your shoes because this is holy land this is where they fight he said this is when I knew he had gone too far and he's starting to make something up that's more so he said I kept my eye on him until what they found that he was involved he was in charge of a cell that had 60 agents under him 60 agents working with the Zionists could you imagine this? Why? Because he's a murai. He's more about let's show everyone, you know, as they stand up, you know, see me. That's why, you know, if you notice know, footballers when they're playing and then they remove the crowds, they hate the game because they love to celebrate for the crowd. They want the crowd to give them the approval. Imagine social media and no one saw what you actually put up. You wouldn't have these people that you want to fall down the stairs while they're dancing on it, Okay. Putting on everywhere you say, see, see those people that, that pretend they're helping someone and get someone to take a photo of them or stuff. You wouldn't have any of that. The Hajj isn't the Hajj anymore. I don't know if anyone's been to the Hajj before the last Hajj. The Hajj is insane because of Riyadh. The Hajj, people are doing Tawaf like this. That's how they do Tawaf, I swear. They're doing Tawaf, and that's how you see all these Statue of Liberties walking around the Kaaba. Because in one hand there's a book, and the other hand is the torch. From the phone. So anyway, they're sitting down. That's how Hajj has become. It's everyone, see me, I'm at Hajj. See me because I am so awesome. When it comes to my acts of worship, has it even gone into this? It's the one that does everything. There are the ones that mix their actions between God and people. The ones that mix, even if it's 1% to the people, God says, I am the best partner. Anything you do and partner someone with me, I'll turn you to get your reward from them. Turn you to them. I don't take any share unless it's holistically for me. Now, what you got to do is do what you normally do. I wanted to explain something so we don't... If you, someone sees you praying and they are happy or see you worshiping, they're happy, this isn't riya. Don't get it wrong. And you feel happy that they saw you praying. Okay? It's not riya. Riya is when you're doing it to make them happy. Do you get what I mean? So someone sees something, makes them happy, and you're happy. For example, I could be praying, and my father watches me praying, he's happy, and I'm happy for that. My father is watching me, and then I'm doing the right thing. But if I do it, like, you know, you know, your dad's watching the news, and you come up in front of the TV, Allahu Akbar. You know, you're probably going to get a remote control in the back of the head. But the thing is, if that's the type of person you are, this is what we call riya. Finish off with a story of a man that went to the masjid and he said, I want to pray because God will test you. 
He said, I want to pray two rakat solely for Allah. So he went in the middle of night to pray. As he went in the mosque, he got up and he started praying with khushu and crying. And then he heard a rattle in the mosque. So he said, God tells you. And he said, well, I'm here with pure intention for God. Now I have an audience for free. You know, so I killed two birds one stone. Just that moment where he thinks. The second he finished praying, he turned around, he saw there was a dog in the mosque that was doing. So the whole time he was sharing his prayer with a dog. This is what, what he was doing. This is the problem with Riyadh. So the only way for me to eliminate Riyadh is to truly believe everything's in God's hands. Truly believe it's God. Truly believe I only want God. Because once I see the significance of God, for what it is, everything else will become insignificant. Inshallah, tomorrow night, we will cover whatever we have left of the questions. And uh, inshallah, by then, there are those that I think, um, there are those who's AIDS on Thursday, isn't it? Or Wednesday? Wednesday. There's those with their AIDS on Thursday, isn't there? And then the, no, there are. There are people that have AIDS on Thursday. Not, not you. It doesn't revolve around you, my friend. There are those that have the aid on Thursday, the ones that follow the meteorology. There are those that um, uh, will look for the moon on Thursday night. There are those that have assumed that Thursday is going to be the 30th. So whether it's the Thursday or the Friday or the Saturday, Kalam wa antum bikhair. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to hasten the reappearance of our master, Al Hujat ibn Al Hassan. المهدي أرواحنا في ذا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أعوذ بجلال وجهك الكريم أن ينقضي عني شهر رمضان أو يطلع الفجر من ليلتي هذه ولك قبلي تبعة أو ذنب تعذبني عليه وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات وإلى أرواح موتانا وموتاكم لشفاء المرضى وقبول الأعمال وتعجيل الفرج رحم الله من قرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات